Good afternoon, everybody. Hello there. Welcome to the uh, Copyright Summit at Medem. Uh, my name's Chris Cook, and I am the MD and founder of a company called CMU. We're based in London, and we help people to navigate and understand the music business. We do that through media, we do it through training, we do it through education, we do it through research, we do it through consultancy. And as part of that mission, I present speed briefings at various conferences around the world on key trends in the music industry. Sometimes those speed briefings are 60 minutes, sometimes they're 30 minutes. Today, brace yourselves for my five minute speed briefing on the music rights data challenge. So I'm going to set the conversation going this afternoon with a very quick five-minute briefing before I introduce my panelists and we get the debate going on all of the challenges around music rights data. So what are we talking about? Let's begin with some very quick copyright basics. Okay, A lot of you in the room will already know this, but let's remind ourselves that every time you write a song, you create a copyright in that song. And every time you record a track, you create a copyright in that track. And obviously, there are two separate copyrights, as far as copyright law is concerned. Songs are one thing, recordings are another. So the, the most basic music copyright fact is that there are two sets of music rights, the song rights and the recording rights. OK, so that's where we're starting. Once you've got a copyright, whether it's in a song or a recording, what copyright law does is it provides the copyright owner with a number of controls over their work. Now, the list of controls, the terminology employed, varies from country to country. But copyright is all about control. That's why copyright exists. Copyright is about giving creators control over what happens to that which they create, to the songs they write and to the recordings they make. And obviously, that's what the copyright business is all about. Copyright says that if you want to make use of somebody else's song or somebody else's recording, you have to get their permission because they have control. And so you have to find whoever owns the copyright and ask for permission to exploit their controls, to use their song or use their recording. And a copyright owner will sell you that permission. They'll ask for some money. And that's how copyright makes money. And that's what we call licensing. So if you want to use somebody else's song or somebody else's recording, the first question you have to ask yourself is, who has control. Who controls the song or the recording that you are looking to utilize? Now, answering that question, who has control, is complicated. In most countries, copyright is an unregistered right. The minute you write a song, the copyright exists. The minute you record a track, the copyright exists. There is no copyright registration. So the law provides us with what you might call default ownership rules, or presumed ownership, or first ownership rules. It tells us who, by default, owns the copyright in a new song or a new recording. Now, those rules differ from country to country. Generally speaking, the default owners of a song will be the songwriter. For a recording, it can be more complicated. But it's even more complicated than that, because the default owner of a copyright can then transfer ownership to somebody else. For money for services, for help in managing those rights. And in the music industry, that happens all the time. Artists and songwriters are transferring their rights to other people, to other entities. Sometimes we call that assignment if it's full transfer ownership. Sometimes we call it a license or maybe even a mandate. Now, copyright law allows transfer of ownership. And it's very flexible when it comes to that transferring taking place. So copyright law says when you transfer your rights to somebody else, you might transfer one set of controls to one entity and another set of controls to another entity. So maybe the reproduction and distribution controls, the mechanical rights to a publisher, and then the performance and communication controls, the performing rights to a society. So we have the different controls going to different entities. We might appoint different agencies to represent our rights for different usages. And we might assign globally or on a country-by-country -country basis. And we might assign for life of copyright, or we may assign for a certain period of time, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. And copyright law allows that, the slicing and dicing of rights. And in the music industry, it happens all the time. But it's more complicated than that. Because once you've assigned your rights to a publisher or a society, they may then point another publisher or another society to represent those rights in certain usages or in certain countries. And on top of all of that, even when a songwriter has assigned off all of their rights, they will probably retain certain rights under contract to share in the money, possibly some vetoes, plus copyright law provides songwriters with what we call moral rights. But it's more complicated than that, because what happens when people collaborate? 
When people collaborate, copyright law says they share the resulting copyright. Songwriters insist on collaborating, so many song copyrights are co-owned. So now we may have three default owners, each of whom can slice and dice their rights and appoint publishers and societies to represent different controls, different usages in different countries at different times, and those publishers and societies may then assign them elsewhere in the world. On the recording side, it's slightly simpler, but not that much simpler. It's complicated. Because, likewise, it may be that you give some rights to a label, some to a distributor, some to a society. Those labels and distributors might then assign them to other people elsewhere in the world. Plus, with recordings, we always have to ask the question, even if we know who owns the recording, are any of the performers in that recording due what we call equitable remuneration under law for this specific use of the track? To conclude, it's complicated. Plus, of course, when we're working with recorded music, we're using the two sets of rights. We need to know this recording, what song is in that recording. And we need to know that not by title, because people keep writing songs of the same name. We need to be more precise about what recordings we're using, and within that recording, what songs are contained. So, if you want to make use of music, there's lots of questions you need to ask yourself. And it's complicated. So, first of all, what recording are you using? What song are you using? Who wrote the song? Who recorded the track? Who controls each element of the copyright for each usage in each country right now? So anybody wanting to use music needs to answer those questions. So they're going to say immediately to the music industry, OK, in order to answer these questions, where's the database? I need a database. Give me the database that answers these questions. And the music industry says, hmm. Yes, sorry, we don't have a database. We forgot to build a database. We've been very busy. Although, actually, technically, that's not true. Actually, the music industry has many databases, too many databases. Labels and publishers have databases. Society have databases. Digital service providers have databases. Audio ID companies have databases. There are crowdsourced databases, and there are commercial databases owned by commercial entities. With all those databases, you have to ask a question. Are they storing the same information in the same format? And does that information agree? You will quite often find it does not. So why does this matter? Why do we need to solve the music rights data challenge? Why do we make it, need to make it easier to answer these questions, to work out who controls what rights in what country at what time? Well, because if you want to launch a music service, you need to know who to do a deal with. And you need to know, once you've got the service live, who to pay. You need to know who to credit for the music that people are consuming. And all of this data is also really important for offering better recommendation services. Without decent music rights data, we have an inferior user experience within the streaming domain. We don't credit the songwriters. It is a moral right of every songwriter to be credited when their music is used. It's a rightful moral right, and we are infringing it every day of the week because of bad data. We don't know who to pay. Not always, obviously, but there are artists and songwriters who are missing out on money because somebody somewhere doesn't know who to pay. And if you're a service provider, there's always the risk you'll get sued because you didn't sort out the rights, because you didn't know who to deal with, and you didn't know who to pay. And that could be a billion-dollar lawsuit. So this is a massive problem that we've been talking about for years in the music industry. We're at a point now where everyone agrees we need to meet this challenge. We just can't necessarily agree quite how we're going to do it. But there is good news. There are lots of people in the music industry who are trying to solve this problem. Societies, labels, publishers, startups, and other organizations. And so CMU has teamed up with MEDEM to review those initiatives, to look at those programs, to speak to those people. And very soon, we're going to be publishing a white paper which will summarize that work. But we wanted to get that conversation going here today as part of the Copyright Summit. And so we've got six people on stage with me here now who are all working on really interesting programs complementary programs in many cases to try and help us meet this music rights data problem, to get people paid, to stop people being sued, to get our writers credited, and to make the streaming experience as good as it possibly can be. So I'm going to talk to each of them in turn about their various projects, and then we're going to have a bigger debate about why this is still a problem and how we might solve it. And so I'm going to get that going, but before I do that, I'm going to ask each of my panelists to very quickly introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. So we'll start on the far side. So if you want to quickly tell us who you are and what you do, and then we'll get going. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's uh, Richard Skidmore, uh, and I'm the head of uh, business development for Dot Blockchain, which is a uh, blockchain-based company in New York and pretty much all over the world. I'm based in London. Hello, I'm Cecilia Weber. I'm a director of licensing, international and operation for SASEM, the uh, French collective organization in charge of music rights mainly, 
And so I'm based in uh, Neuilly, close to Paris. Hello, I'm Vladimir Filip, I'm CEO of company Heaven Eleven. We're based in Ireland. I'm Molly Newman, I'm the global head of business development for SongTrust. Uh, we're a publishing administration platform for songwriters and small businesses, um, and I'm in New York. Hello, my name is Fernando Marcos. I'm the regional manager of Back Office Music Services, and we are based in South America. Hi, I'm Barbara Finney. I'm a product manager at Grace Note. We're a Nielsen company. We provide uh, metadata to connect fans to the entertainment they love, and I'm based near San Francisco and Emeryville. Okay, so a good international panel, all coming from uh, different aspects of the music industry, uh, trying to meet this music rights data challenge on both the recordings and the song side, but particularly the song side and, of course, the holy grail of matching the two sets of data. Um, so I'm going to begin with Fernando. Um, so you mentioned the company Back Office. You're based in Latin America. So I suppose just very quickly start off by giving us a quick history of, of why Back Office came into being and, and what the services that you are providing today for publishers, for societies, and, and for digital services? Well, we, we started in the year 2000 as a software factory. We started providing service to the music publishers and to the PROs, so we learned a lot about the music business the, on the Arthur Wright sites, and we loved it. So we decided to create a special unit called Back Office Music Services in order to provide services to the publishers and PROs. Uh, in the year 2010, the Brazilian Music Publishers Chamber decided to create a digital hub uh, in Brazil. So they called us in order to collaborate with them. So we helped them with all the operational and the technological tasks. Then in the year 2014, the Latin American music publishers and author societies decided to create the Latin American one-stop shop, and they called us to collaborate with them. And more recently, we started collaborating with Capasso, the, the Pan-African Mechanical Hub. So we are also very happy to, to work with them. I suppose, I mean, to explain the, the service you're now providing to the, to the Brazilian hub, the Latin American hub, and and excitingly moving in, into Africa as well. It's this idea of, of the matching recording data and song data and then knowing what to do with, with the, the song once you've got it. So I suppose to very quickly explain to the audience, if you've not read my book, Dissecting the Digital Dollar, which explains how the streaming business works, which you all should, um, but we, we explain in there that if, if, I'm, if I'm a streaming service, and I do deals with record companies, and the record companies and distributors start uploading content into my service, I stream that music. I assume, possibly rashly, that whoever provided me the recording must control the recording rights, so when their music is streamed, I pay them. But then obviously there are songs in those recordings, and, and the streaming service doesn't know what those songs are. And so in the main, the streaming services have outsourced that work, and they say to their licensing partners, whether that's a publisher or a society, okay, Here's a list of everything we streamed last month, the track name and ISRC. You work it out. <laughs> you work it out. So in essence, that's one of the things that you were doing in Brazil, in Latin America, in Africa. One of the big services that you are doing for the publishers and societies is taking that massive list from the streaming services and then working out with the recordings that have been streamed what songs are contained within those recordings. Well, yes, we have 19 years of matching experience because we started in the physical world uh, matching label copies, uh, physical released, releases of, of music. Then we start working with the digital environment. And yes, of course, uh, we make a lot of effort in order to be able to match the phonogram information where generally the DSPs inform you the song title and the, and the performer name. And we need to match it with the, the, with the works that we have the song title and the composer split. So, Fortunately, uh, we, we have a lot of collaboration from our uh, partners, let's say the publishers and the PROs, because we share with them uh, unknown performances lists. They try to match as much as they can. Also, they are always sharing with us all the information about, uh, they know about their songs, who are the performers that ever performed their songs, which are the IRC codes, uh, the phonogram codes of the, the phonograms where those songs are uh, included. 
Uh, in Brazil, we have the, a lot of medleys, so we also have to deal with that. A single code containing a lot of works inside, so we are, we are also very specialized in working with medley. And of course, we have to do our matching team. Uh, if all of this doesn't work, and if all of our matching algorithm doesn't work, or, that, or, 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 or do not bring the, the correct uh, matching option, where we have a specialized team, very specialized team, that tries to search in different sources to find which are the correct writers associated to that phonogram and in that way make the, the correct match. And I think that's what's interesting. I mean, a number of the people on the panel today, it's one of the services that their companies does, is this matching tracks to songs. So uh, in theory, that should be matching an ISRC, the unique code for every recording, with an ISWC, the unique code for every song, assuming the label remember to give it an ISRC and that the writers remember to get an ISWC. And, and with that process, it's, it's interesting that a certain amount of it can be automated, but a certain amount of it is basically detective work. It's having teams of people who are being detectives. And if it comes to, to SASM Next, because obviously this is a service that, that SASM is offering, not just for its own members, because obviously SASM now works with a lot of publishers with that Anglo-American repertoire, with, with Universal and with Warner and with lots of indies through Impel. And, and Okay. <laughs> Let's add, add all the lists of all the publishers <laughs> you're now working with. So it's Anglo-American repertoire for lots of publishers, as well as obviously the SASM French repertoire. But you have a team of people who, yes, the automated system will try and match as much as it can, but you also there's some detective work to be done, which revolves, involves the human brain. Yes, for sure. We've been collecting ISOCs for a while now because, uh, as Manano mentioned, in the phonomechanicals area, we used to manage uh, ISOCs as well. And our chance was that uh, we managed to uh, set up a partnership with Universal as a label, UMG. And uh, we uh, set up what we call the central licensing agreement in Europe. So considering that Universal represents about 40% market share in terms of recordings, we collect a lot of information. And uh, we partner as well with a uh, lot of society, a lot of different sources, such as uh, Yacast, BMAT, to enrich our data, to be in a position to properly automatically identify uh, the, uh, the content. Uh, the issue is that first, you are not 100% sure that the ISC has been delivered. So in an area such as streaming where you have back catalog, you don't have only front catalog, that's our chance. You can have access to 50 million tracks. So sometimes you don't have ISCs uh, allocated. But on top of that, uh, you may have ISCs that have been, uh, unfortunately, wrongly um, uh, given. So you, you, you have a lot of mess, to be honest, in, in that data. Then you have the ISWC. Uh, that uh, may have correctly attributed, but sometimes not. So that's why there is, and maybe we're going to elaborate on that, there's a big project within CISAC, with a C, uh, to, uh, to see how we can restructure the allocation of the ISWC. Yeah, because to quickly explain, these codes, these standard codes that we're using to identify recordings and songs, so the IFPI, the Global Record Industry Trade Body, is responsible for, IFP, uh, for the ISRC. Uh, the issue is that, sorry, just to mention that IFPI, it's the local IFPI that are responsible. So there is not a worldwide attribution of this code. That's the issue. Yes, because the, uh, although IFPI oversee it, actually each label is allowed to issue its own ISRCs. You're right. Um, and and then on the, on the ISWC side, CISAC, the global grouping for collecting societies around the world, is responsible for that. It has a process for issuing it. And they announced a couple of months ago, didn't they, that they're going to look into uh, making it quicker and more efficient so that people... Yeah, because first, sometimes you, you may not have ISWC. Then you have the issue when you have co-writers and you are talking about the issue. Uh, and there is more and more song. We discuss about that, that you may have an average of nine different creators per song now, for instance, in the United States. So imagine that if those creators belong to different societies throughout the world, they may assign an ISWC, and then how then you match to the RSSs. So, and then you have the, other, the opposite. You may have one song, but it's recorded several times, and then you have a multiple ISOCs linked to one ISWC. So all these different uh, information must be, must be in, a, in a given database where you have to reconcile, where you have to clean that. But unfortunately, even if you do your own job in your own society, it doesn't prevent you from being, let's say, 
messed up by the others. That, no, I mean, that's true. So we must collaborate. And that's how we came to a project that maybe uh, we're going to discuss about that. It's called Elixir with our friend from uh, ASCAP and PRS. Yeah, so I suppose we just, let's quickly touch on that as you brought it up. So, I mean, as you say, I identifying what ISWC is in each ISRC isn't new with streaming, because we used to have to do that with, with vinyl and then cassettes and then compact discs. But I, it's just a much bigger task in the streaming world because you've got 50 million tracks in there from day one. What was it, that stat recently? 40,000 new tracks being added every week. So then you, uh, every day, uh, do the maths, whatever that is. And then that means every month when you're getting these reports in, there'll be new ISRCs you've never seen before that need to be matched. And so around the world, various societies, publishers, organizations like Back Office and yourselves are trying to do this matching. But there is the issue of, what, are you matching it the same? And so that's, that this is an initiative to get three ed different entities who are all doing this detective work so that you can see if, we're, if you're all agreeing on what ISRC and what ISWC should be matched. Yes, exactly, because for, you know, for uh, something that is obvious, you may have an ISOC that has been uh, allocated in Europe, for instance, by the you know local label, and another one in United States. So ASCAP may match. You know, one ISOC is when when is ISWC where I will match with another one. And now with this global player, you know, when we used to have this local business, that was different. To be honest, that was easier. But now you have global player with global information. So you must be sure that what I will recognize will fit with the information within ASCAP database as well to pay properly their writers, specifically because SASM, we do handle now a massive amount of Anglo-American repertoire. But, and this is a case as well to disseminate properly our information within the database of the other peers, because for instance, in the United States, ASCAP is responsible to, for the SASM repertoire. And I want to be sure that when we agree on a matching between the ISOCs and the ISWC, we will all apply the same um, matching. So that's why we decide to enter into that partnership with PRS and ASCAP because we are three of the most important society in the world, of course, with GEMA and uh, with uh, BMI. I'm not going to mention every, everybody is important, but let's say <laughs> we Some are, are more important. And, and to be honest, we agree together, and all the other one were maybe uh, interested by other uh, partnership uh, at this moment. And so uh, we decide to share all our information. But was it, what was really important for us, and maybe we're going to discuss that uh, with uh, Richard, it was could we maybe use the blockchain system um, to be sure that once we agree on a matching, then there is an agreement on this matching. And if we want to change that or add some new information, we are all in an agreement to move that. We don't want to, once it's clean, we don't want to see our information corrupted by someone else without our consent. Yes, corrected and in inverted commas. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why we use uh, the uh, the blockchain. So it's a it's a mix of blockchain. It's a mix of uh, uh, of uh, cleaning. And uh, so we are quite happy because we are now at the stage three of this. Uh, of this development, and uh, if we are able to prove that uh, it's successful in terms of cleaning and uh, to serve the uh, interest, then of course we will share that with other society. Um, the first partners we, we may have uh, in uh, soon will be publishers, because the data come f from them first, and uh, even the publisher are not sure 100% that their own documentation is available. So, and of course, there will be other PROs. And uh, the, the, the final goal is, of course, to share all of this with the DSP themselves. Because we will serve the DSP if they are, if they have in their own database, as you mentioned, they have database, clean data. So it's, it's trying to get everybody to agree. I mean, let's come to, to Barbara next. So I suppose Grace Note, I mean, anyone who put a CD into a laptop in the early 2000s and uh, iTunes opened up will, will have heard of Grace Note. So it began as a, as a massive crowdsourced database of, of information around tracks. Then the labels got on board and the labels started pumping their data in. It became part of being in the record industry is to get your data into the Grace Note database. So I think on the recording side, people will probably be quite familiar with what Grace Note does. But I think what's interesting 
is, is to learn that at Grace Note 2, you've got a, a, a new division which is looking at this song data and gathering the song data and this matching of recordings to, 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 to songs. So maybe give us a little bit of background as to where that side of the business came from. Sure. Thanks, Chris. As, as Chris mentioned, we've you know, been building a recording database over the last 20 years. And um, we are now owned by Nielsen. So our expertise is managing and matching complex data sets. So we've got uh, a global normalized database of artists, albums, recordings. And it became apparently more and more obvious, especially with streaming, that um, the song data also needed to be normalized. And you know, we did some research and it's estimated 20 to 50% of um, rights payments don't make it to their rightful owner. And, you know, there's over, I don't know, somebody just said two and a half billion dollars sitting in a black box right now, ready to be distributed. So we were like, that's our expertise, managing data sets, let's help with that. So um, we've been collaborating with the industry, with, you know, the publishers and societies and other entities to, um, to help solve that, to, that problem and to understand the pain points and to help clean up the data. So um, as we've, we've you know, done proof of concepts and we've brought in publisher data and we've looked at um, you know, some of that and we realize, as, as Cecile was saying, a lot of publishers have differing views of the same work. Um, now, we can, you, know, you can pretty much trust, for the most part, what a publisher says about their own songwriter. And you know, there's different pieces of data, like the IPI code, which is their interested party ID that needs to be right. And that's usually pretty good with the publisher. But when another publisher is registering that same work, they might you know, assign a different IPI to that songwriter, because a songwriter might have multiple IPIs in the, in the database world. I think that's another <laughs> unique identifier we're throwing into the mix there. So we have yeah. identifiers for recordings, we have identifiers for songs, we have identifiers for songwriters and publishers, and we have identifiers for performers. Right, and sometimes a um, songwriter might have a different IPI as a songwriter, um, or a different name, like Bruno Mars, as a performer is Peter Jean Hernandez as a songwriter. So it's really important to understand all the complexities of these data points and try to match them together. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the problem that we are, we're hoping to help. And, you know, then it also comes to not only normalizing that song data, but mapping it to recordings. And because we've got this extensive data set of recordings with, you know, that we've collected from the labels with all of the different ISRCs, and different codes associated with that. Um, we can make a link to, you know, from one work to all of the recordings of that song by that artist, whether it's the same recording on different albums and different releases, or um, a different version, a live version, an acoustic version, those are all in the same. And we do that as a combination of technology because we have fingerprint technology at Grace Note, we do recognition along with metadata and the expertise of our 1,300 editors around the world, who some of which are musicologists. And when companies come to the table and say, okay, we're gonna try and help address this, this challenge, I suppose the, the first question to say is, well, where are you getting your initial data from? So obviously, with back office, you, they have the society publisher clients, so that their clients are pumping it in, with SASM as a society already had a database there. So on, on the Grace Note side, I, 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 you're, you're reaching out to, to the publishing community to get them involved in this, and that's how you're accessing, obviously, recording side, you're sorted, but on the publishing side, that's getting new data into your system. That's correct. So we have been, you know, working, collaborating with the publishers um, to collect their data and show them, you know, you know, make sure that we really understand the issues and the pain points and making sure that we solve this problem right the first time um, to help them create, you know, a global data set, data set. And because we are global and because we are sort of a neutral third party, um, we feel, you know, and the publishers are, you know, they trust us for the most part to, um, to help them, you know, create a comprehensive view of the, of the ownership. Let's come to Vladimir next. Um, so we've, we've had various companies represented. I'm, I'm really interested to just get a little bit more about where your business, Heaven Eleven, where it originally came from, and then we can talk about what it is that you're doing here today. But just give us a very quick history of, of how the business came into being. Uh, our business started uh, 10 years ago uh, when uh, one of our company bumped into necessity to set up a certain 
CRM system to track the rights which belong to our publishers, original publishers who, whose rights we controlled back then. And uh, we made certain searches across the world for searching for the proper appropriate uh, solution for us to register the repertoire and then to mark who right, whose rights we control for the certain territories. And back then we've been operating uh, in 12 territories simultaneously, uh, receiving data from approximately 34 territories uh, same time. So we recognized that we felt to find such a solution and we decided, okay, why don't we do it ourselves? So uh, we've taken an effort to analyze the whole path, how data flows in and how we use this afterwards. And we found it uh, irrational to make same very recording to be registered twice or same very work registered twice. So we just created a system which was registering each and every IP only once and granulated down to each and every participant who created initially and then just setting up claims of all of our partners against each and every share, uh, providing us with information who they, uh, whose shares they control or own on what basis, for what territory, for what period of time, or what right types, and so on, and how they divide their uh, royalties. And started from there, we started to enrich our database rapidly, and any new partner who's been coming in, they've been providing us with that, such information, and to date, we've gathered the data uh, of almost 22 million musical works, which are uh, claimed by thousands of parties to a certain extent. Yeah, so I suppose you were getting data in from your partners, from rights owners, from publishers, all sorts of different data. I, I know that different partners were providing data in different ways, in different formats, and so you, in essence, were pulling it all into one place, cleaning it up, and, and then building the platform that could help you and they and any partners they work with truly understand who owned what rights and who could do what with what. Our business started in the area which was kind of a dark hole for all uh, all other world in Russia. We used that territory as an advantage because legal-wise that was reminding us the US where the publishers may directly claim the rights uh, around the society. Or, and therefore, we've, as I've said, we use that uh, as an advantage to implement new practice. And uh, definitely data was coming from different areas uh, from the companies who had different uh, level of expertise and knowledge. Some data was absolutely demolished. Uh, some data we were uh, forced to apply uh, kind of society practices, to apply rules. Uh, depends on their affiliation. For example, if the French publisher was coming in and giving us just title and saying, okay, I hold 50% and no information about uh, any share sizes on the writers, We've been just augmenting that data, applying the same rules. So just setting up that, okay, if those writers he control in full, then uh, that's the rules on the mechanical division and that's the rule on the performance division. And then we've been setting up claims, augmenting that data. When And when that publisher was coming in, in back, he was really being surprised that his data had in the perfect condition, he was really, <laughs> Uh, asking yeah, so where. He, he sent some basic clues to you and then you were returning, we can now tell you this is how the rights in your songs work. Uh, exactly, and it just we were, ex we were experiencing such a uh, uh, kind of a dirty data uh, permanently through the years and which uh, the data, even from the kind of quite standard software was uh, was coming to us incomplete, let's say there was a software called Counterpoint Maestro or Vistex, which is world, worldwide well known and many large entities are using this. But it has uh, such an ability to, or gives such an ability to interpret the same data, same set of data in many different ways. So if uh, the uh, users have not uh, uh, proper skills, they may use and form their data in an absolute, absolutely inappropriate order and data has to be reformed uh, upon the arrival. So we've learned and we've faced uh, lots of different scenarios how data have been uh, reformed. So for example, one uh, or other publisher was sending us 
registration and work initially, and then another publisher was coming and saying, oh, I'm representing same uh, song, but on behalf of different writer. They may have been having different division uh, among the writers, just because, let's say, in Germany, uh, lyricist and uh, composer have certain split uh, on the mechanical, and it will rise to another split on the performance side, while the same work was registered on SSM, and SSM had uh, one metric, like one or two third on the mechanical, and the percentage uh, metric on the performance side. So you, you can imagine how uh, that data was right one to another one. So it's and been quite challenging. That takes, I mean, obviously, we, we, we focus in on the, the ISRC, ISWT matching problem, but I think what, what, um, what we're explaining here is, in my presentation at the start, that slicing and dicing of the rights. And, and copyright law allows that to happen. And on one level, it's great that copyright law allows that flexibility, but it can mean for a single song around. And actually, if, if, if your data, I sat down, we sat down the other night, didn't you? And you were showing me some of the works in the database. And it, when you look at a single work in your database, you truly start to appreciate the complexities because your database is able to say for this song, this usage, this control, this element of the rights in this country. And as you say, it may be that the, the songwriters agree different things in different countries, or it may be there are different industry conventions in different countries, different collection static conventions. And so like for a single song, there are hundreds of different combinations of how the money might be due. I, I would say hundreds is too less. So we realized that just it may be zillions of combinations per work per day. That's what actually we realized when we started to first uh, snap, uh, make a snaps of uh, kind of snaps of those kind of uh, lookups per every combination. And our data start, uh, database has started rapidly growing. We realized it's a dead end, and we just uh, sat down and we've been trying to rethink uh, how we're going to manage that data, and the, at the end of the day, that was happening five years ago, we decided, no, we're not going to make a record records of all of these slices, it's just a dead end. And we've uh, uh, came up with another solution, we changed the philosophy of how we're approaching data, and we decided, why don't we just uh, register an initial data and let certain algorithms which are applying all those binding rules of the alliance of uh, domestic societies on all type of subjects, like on the documentation distribution, upon the request when we need to make certain type of operation, whether the licensing request or royalty distribution request or dispute resolution request. And we've uh, came from uh, and observed that data from other angle, and we realized that it's not the database is needed, but the resolution solution is needed. And uh, then we went in absolutely different direction. And for the last five years, we've been creating solutions which are helping parties to resolve their data. Uh, not like, and we, we at some point we realized that there, it's very unlikely it's going to be one united database. We had we, we seen those parades of database through the years, and they just like the biggest one was GRD, which was happily collapsed. The global <laughs> repertoire database. If you'd been so, here 10 years ago, we would have been talking and about it. We, 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 we had a chat with the Mark Isherwood and Pete and Jenner at some point, uh, because they were on the board of GRD, and they said, oh boy, you've succeeded to make it, but uh, just it's very likely the whole world is going to use that. So you have to find something other, uh, some other approach how to persuade people to start using it, because despite it's in everyone's uh, favor, it is very unlikely everyone is going to use that. And then we decided, so we need uh, to create kind of a, not a central database, but central resolution uh, uh, table where any databases may communicate and recognize, okay, on, let's say, on SASM, PRS, ASCAP database, data may look uh, pretty much resolved, but there are hundreds of other databases which may not agree with the resolution data you have. And uh, so, and uh, they may compete with those databases. They may be competitor business-wise, and how to avoid uh, for those competitors to have to keep that issue simultaneously, permanently, because they both are 
losing out of that incompetence, incom out of that lack of understanding that somebody, somebody else is just county claiming, for example. Let's say we have a database and, uh, of ICE, which is brilliant, but ICE is just a bunch of the societies and there are just it's less than even a third of the industry. Like yeah, so I, I, I'm sure people know, but ICE is a JV between PRS, Stim, and Gamer, and then obviously they have other societies involved in their database. Ex exactly. As well. So they, let's say that SoCan has their own database. So the uh, uh, in Canada, we're doing a lot of uh, initials the, uh, uh, in this. Yeah, the, we, we have <laughs> we, we have a database of ICAT, yeah. which uh, back office is handling, and they just there are a bunch of Latin American societies. They have their own node. Uh, we have a database in Asia, for example, cash, so and so on and so on. And just in what we've uh, realized that when data comes from different sources, it is rarely much. And that was the issue. And we say, said to ourselves, so it makes no sense to build a database. It's better to build a resolution table because data is going to be changing permanently. Uh, people just uh, have to come to an agreement when they agreed then the data may be used, but they may disagree next very minute and it makes no sense to make a recording of that piece of data regardless of the technology, whether it's a blockchain or whether it's a sequential database or whatever. It's better to generate the data, use this and forget. Next very minute they may disagree and then it's not needed or they came to an agreement and then we may use this right away here on demand and that's the philosophy we started to practice in our, uh, in our system, we decided, okay, we're going to generate that data on demand. If, let's say, Apple comes to us and say, who are we going to uh, get the license from for that work, for this territory, for that this and that share, for that product, for commercial model use type, and so on, and then we granulate this request and send to the resolution table and call all the database and say, who is responsible? for that very combination. And then if uh, all the responses arrived on the resolution table not disputing, then we send it back to Apple. Or if they are disputing, unless it's resolved, it's not being sent to Apple. And, and I suppose what's, it was, so what's interesting there is a service which was originally helping predominantly rights owners organize their rights, understand their rights, and then you, you sort of evolve that. And now it's a service as much for the digital services. You're, you're, you're providing a, a service for the streaming services who are trying to navigate all of this think, data challenge. That happened by coincidence because we've been, uh, as I've said, we're just almost 10 years old. And through the years, uh, our activity was reminding me the, ac uh, the activity of that poor girl from Be Bob Sinclair's video where she's been running through the street uh, with a large heart. She was trying to give it away. Nobody wanted so we felt the same, you know, uh, for almost five years. And then at some, at some point, we just realized that uh, someone someone recognized us and said, oh, guys, you, you may probably resolve our issues because we've been approached by hundreds of societies, rights management organizations who are sending us their f claim feeds. And they are in different formats and they are permanently clashing and so on. Can you kind of manage this so park? And we just said, why not? So they, and we've... Uh, came to the same problem from the other, from the other uh, perspective, from the DSP perspective. We've uh, apparently get, gotten access to a huge amount of data from all those hundreds of databases in one shot. We brought them, in, uh, brought them all in and recognized just enormous amount of conflicts. And we said, oh boy, it's just like, a, that's, that's a poor world, you know, because uh, try to imagine, so if the uh, the organization is claiming their rights and the, uh, they're getting a response uh, which they haven't even expected to get. So they re didn't, for example, in one territory, they didn't, didn't expect that their songs are being used at all. And they received that, that response. They said, oh, great, we have our songs being used there. But why, why do you pay us 50%? And apparently they realized that they documented their uh, claim incorrectly. They've claimed only the writer's share. They didn't claim the publisher's share. And that was written over the documentation. They just, someone has just forgotten to put one dot or push some button on their system. And they've claimed only half of that. But it's us who just reproduced that claim and forwarded it on the DSP and formed the response uh, made them understand that 
they've observed they claim and said, oh, we're only claiming 50%. That means they're receiving only half of the money they're eligible to receive. And this is happening all across because it's definitely uh, uh, complicated. It's yeah. I'm going I'm to come back to the underclaim, overclaim thing. I, I just want to get our other two guests into the mix. And so hold the fort on the underclaiming, overclaiming, because it's one of the big issues we're trying to solve here. But I just want to very quickly come to, uh, to Richard next. Um, a few years ago, most conferences like this one had a music rights data panel in which uh, often there were several startups represented on the panel. Um, and then several of those startups had a blockchain-based solution we then spent 50 minutes trying to work out what the blockchain was. Then the panel was over and nothing proceeded. And so almost one That's of the things... That's what we're going to do today again. <laughs> so one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to almost get, get this panel together again in 2019 is to sort of look back in on some of those initiatives and focus less on the technology and more on the data and the solution. Um, so obviously... Dot Blockchain was one of the startups that was being represented at those events, and, and obviously your, your founder, Benji Rogers, was doing a lot of those panels. I suppose, bring us up to date on, on what is, as with any startup, the product has evolved over those years. So, so what is the Dot Blockchain product that you're trying to build today? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I think the difference now, from our point of view, is you know we differ from a lot of our other competitors in the blockchain space, is that we're not building hype. One of the biggest problems has been, still is, that everyone is saying we're doing this, that, and the other, but they're not actually working with anyone. Uh, we uh, have been building for the last year with a global major and a global publisher, and we've also partnered with Fuga to uh, build into their live platform. So our product has evolved over, uh, over time, um, but we differ um, a little bit from uh, some of the other approaches that are out there. You know, you could see from your slide at the start, this is a song track issue and its journey is varied for every single different song. So we uh, embed our technology and the rights into the song. So no matter where the song goes, you know, if you're uh, a 16 year old kid in their bedroom and you're recording a track tonight, you're, you're probably knowing your artist name and, and maybe your songwriter credits. If you fast forward two years time, you might then have a publisher, a label, a PRO, you know, wh whoever you can bring those in. So we, our system basically is a synchronization uh, tool to, tool, to uh, connect all the various parties, some of them on the stage here today, so that everyone has visibility. Because I think that's the key, is visibility and ownership of your content. If you own it, you should be able to have visibility throughout its lifespan. That doesn't happen at the moment. So within our technology, you can then say, okay, well, I am the songwriter, but then I want to tag in a publisher and a PRO, and then they then have access to that data. Um, and they then can um, use that data, and we have a, a, a dynamic scoring engine, which I won't go into too much detail. Come see me after if you want to get geeky. But um, which uh, helps to sort of map who is who and gives you authenticity about the players in the market. So... We obviously uh, connect ISRC to ISWC as well, because that's a big issue. So we have what's called, a, uh, we've named it a bundle. So it's like a wrapper. So if you look at what you need to release, you need the audio track, the works information, the master information, and the release information. And if you want to add the artwork, you can. And that is our core bundle. We tag all those together, and we use blockchain technology to put the hash embedded into the audio. The reason we do that is that you then don't weigh the audio down with all the information that you need for its lifespan. Through that process, we can uh, convert DDEX and CWR into a readable format that they both can, um, can be used together, and we can then embed that into the technology. So, yeah. I suppose the, 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 the key element there is, yeah, this idea of linking the actual WAV file, the actual audio file, with a little bundle of data that has the song data and the recording data and linking the two together. Uh, more, more initials, DDEX is just a standard system for recording data. Um, and then what you said, CWR, oh, which is the song equivalent, another SISAC initiative. Again, it's standards for storing data. So we, we, it's, it's about having a bundle of data over here, which is locked into an audio track over here in a way that can't be removed. Because obviously you can put metadata in a WAV file, but then I can come in and amend the metadata. Very the much so, file. and that's one of the big issues. You know, you will probably meet blockchain companies that will tell you that they're going to do everything on the chain. We've tried that. It doesn't work. Um, what you need to do is you need to put the key 
changes that, and the key agreements, that's where the blockchain is more powerful than any database. And I'll argue with any CTO that you can do this with traditional database technology. You can't. You know, our model is, is, a, is a hybrid of cloud, traditional database architecture. But the key point of, do you agree? Have we agreed 50-50 split? Are we both in agreement? That is what needs to go onto the chain. And so that is what we've built out already with our, our label partner. And we're now entering into the second phase of that where we're going to try uh, multi-party um, multi ownership, which is, for me, where we will really prove that the technology uh, works conclusively. So the little bundle of data sits on this thing called the blockchain, which is just basically a ledger that exists on lots of computers around the world, and they all automatically update and tell a story of every single bit of data that was added, any change of ownership, any change of claim that occurred, and the story can't be changed. The story no, is always yeah, there. That, that's, that's where you get the real value. You know, as I say, from that kid in that bedroom that's recording tonight to two years down the line, whatever, you have the full breadcrumb trail all the way back, all the changes that were agreed, and it's linked to the track. So that is hugely positive and useful in the business and will hopefully solve a lot of the issues. But within that, we are not setting ourselves up, as Vladimir says, to the GRD. That was a big mistake. How we work is that we uh, will build this out and let our artists put their content on themselves, but we are also working with all the big players in the business and we feel like they have that specialist knowledge and we want to actually build the communication layers between them. We do that with what's called APIs, so we, we connect into each of their systems. What that brings is it keeps the competitive edge in the business, because if you're Sony ATV, you're not going to want to open up all your uh, systems to uh, Warner Chapel and vice versa. And so if you're working on a collaborative project, you can share the data with each other. And at the point that you agree something, that goes onto the chain. And we feel that's a much better way of working. Of course, one of the questions, and I think part of the, the the pilot that you've just mentioned with the major rights owners is going to answer this question, is that little bundle of data that's going to go on the blockchain is saying, well, okay, what's actually in that? We know what standards we may be complying with, but actually what lines of data are going in that? And as I understand it, that will be one of the outcomes of your pilot, is, is finalising actually what data can and should go on the chain. Yeah, I mean, you, you can build a, a, ch a chain now and you can put the whole of DDEX into it but then you'll press a button. If you want to update it, it'll take you 10 minutes for it to update. So long term, that is not scalable. We're looking to scale this. What you need to do is the, the, the point that you have the decision and the agreement between the parties. As I was saying, because you have the dynamic scoring engine, within that, every party, so say SASM or and Warner Chapel and uh, Universal would all have a score as a data contributor. And then that also plays into the field. So we have scores against the field. That then brings you into a position where if you add good data, your score will rise just like your score in, in your Uber account. If you put bad data in, it'll go down. And that will allow us to get the bad characters out of the business, which is one of the things that is a big issue. And long term, that will allow you then to open it more up to the sort of general public and people outside the sort of the traditional industry to add data. And of course, the first day you do that, a thousand people are going to come on and claim they're Beyonce. But if you, you know, keep uh, that scoring engine, they will then be pulled out. So we feel that you know, data is fluid and there's no you know, set score for anyone. You know? As long as you remember not to block Beyonce out when she claims Beyonce. Yeah, very true. <laughs> Okay, let's come to, to Molly next. Thank you for sitting patiently. We've got so many guests My here. So many stories to tell. Um, but I suppose, you know, what, one of the themes we've had throughout this, all of these, these, these organizations, societies, startups, building these databases, the question I always ask any organization that comes to me is, well, where's the data coming from? And I suppose you're part of an organization that is building a database of the songs of the writers and the publishers you work with. Correct. So I suppose just, just very quickly explain to us what the Song Trust service is and, and how it came about. Sure. I mean, it's, it's global publishing administration. So we are the model of a, of a traditional publisher. Um, we directly affiliate with societies around the world so that we can send uh, information directly to SSM and that has a complete picture. Um, we are very... Uh, bullish about our clients adding ISRC information to their ISWC 
uh, composition information so that we are sending as complete a picture as possible and um, being as, as good an actor as we possibly can. So that means a lot of encouragement towards our clients to, to really understand why, if one of the, the major value propositions that we offer is that we collect you know, the performance and mechanical royalties for, for them as a traditional publisher would. And um, because the streaming revenue has increased so significantly on the publishing side, if we don't have that recording information, there's a massive gap and uh, they won't be paid what they're owed. And so uh, we spend a lot of time trying to encourage, and we work primarily with individual songwriters and, and clients. So now we have over 200,000 songwriters that we uh, work with. Um, and uh, it's, you know, over 1.7 million copyrights. Uh, so it's a lot of information, and, you know, we want to make sure that it's as complete. It's, we, we very much want to be good partners to the industry and to our, our colleagues at the Societies and Services. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of information. It's, it, it's challenging. Um, <laughs> we're pushing the limits of the pipes, if you will. Um, but uh, so we need... The, our clients to understand how important that is to do that that fundamental work to get their splits correct to um, make sure that those um, you know that what we deliver to our global network um, doesn't have as as those doesn't have conflict whenever possible and it, you know when we do for example have a new client who was with a previous publisher or self published and there are um, works registered you know somewhere and that the split might be slightly different, 33.4% instead of 33.3%, that'll get returned and, and the, you know, that's when the resolution process begins. And it, it's, it's quite complicated, as you've mentioned many times. <laughs> it is quite complicated. And I, I suppose in some ways what, what you're trying to do with Song Trust is for the self-publishing writer or indeed smaller independent publishers, um, there are all of these databases in order for this to work, we need to get accurate information into as many of those databases as possible. Right. But the self-publishing writer sitting in France or the UK or Ireland or the US right. doesn't have the resource to do that on itself. So I suppose an element is the idea is you come to your platform, you enter the accurate data, and then what your platform does is it's connected to everybody else. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, there. again, we're we're trying to to sort of be part of the solution. Um, you know, with the existing framework that we have, and we do want to continue to develop our technology so that's the using all the innovation that I think that you know many of the panelists are are discussing. Um, but with what we have now, at least have the the basics right, and so that when we do, we're you know the individual databases that we do have to send them to, um, you know, can correct the conflicts on their end point, and hopefully there will be some sort of more holistic solution in the future. So Song Trust was set up by, by the music publisher Downtown. Yes. And I suppose, as I understand it, the technology was initially built to help manage Downtown's own catalogue. Yeah. And, and, and so I suppose there is an element of why then, having built that platform, rather than keeping it just for your own catalogue, why roll it out to, in essence, competitors and, and self-publishing writers? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, Justin Cliffwitz, our CEO um, and co-founder, uh, the original concept was to, to help a friend of his who was a writer and had a percentage of a song that um, had had, they knew had um, revenue out in the world, but wasn't a proper downtown appropriate client. And um, so didn't envision the administration piece being something that was easy to um, to offer. And we don't do sync or creative and, and you know, we don't have writers get together. We purely do the, the pipes of, of publishing. And so um, that's given us a little bit more of a, of a clean, ability to offer that to other services. So our, our major client um, until now that we are part of the same company um, was CD Baby for the last five years. Um, and so that's been our, our major growth trajectory. And, and one of the benefits of that has been CD Baby clients are already you know creating ISRCs. So when they become the CD Baby Pro client and become, you know, set up their own publishing administration around the world, it's already a, a complete picture of both sides. There are different elements to this data challenge and almost it, it's worth breaking it down because if we just try and look at the all in one go, it's so complicated. It's, it's hard to think of a solution. So it's the good C to break word. it down. So we, we spent quite a lot of time talking about the ISWC, ISLC matching element and then how can we make sure we're all reaching the same conclusions. 
Vladimir brought up, I suppose, another key element, which is song split information and disagreements of song split information, and which in the streaming space can result in, for certain works, not all the money being claimed and some money just sitting in Spotify's bank account because only 80% of the rights have been claimed. But perhaps worse is when 120% is claimed. And the official rule is when 120% is claimed, nobody gets paid until somebody can work out how to allocate it. Um, and I mean, I'll come to Seal Mexico out because I felt you sort of wanted to come in on that. I mean, you know, how big a problem is that around the world? And, and you know, there are various platforms and initiatives that attempt to, to synchronize to an extent all the different databases. And, and how well is that working today? And what could we do to, to overcome that issue better? First, I think that on our side at SASM, our chain that as we work with many publishers, different publishers, so we don't expect to wait till the invoice of the claim to the DSP that there is a conflict. So we manage at SASM to solve the conflict before. So if, for instance, we receive a CWR from Universal and Warner Chapel, and for any reason, each of them are claiming 70% of the same work, so it's reached to 140% because you're very good in mathematics, so you do the addition. Uh, then in that case, of course, we come back to our partners and mention, okay, you have to solve the conflict. So there is many different solutions. You may have heard that the um, industry have implemented it when uh, iTunes was very big, uh, the click solution as well. So there is inside the society, third party provider. And to be honest, I think that that, that will be sold uh, very easily with the big publisher, many publisher. As you may realize now, when you listen to all the different partnerships, there is more and more communication between publisher, right owners, and societies, providers, tech company, to clean the data. And now nobody is afraid, I mean the big players, nobody is afraid now to send all the repertoire information uh, to, to different parties. That, that, that's unbelievable now. Ten years ago, everybody has his documentation that was hidden. You know, that was the secret. And now everybody understands that the, the, the secret of success is to get the right writers, but not to keep the documentation. You have to share all the relevant information. Now, the issue, to be honest, and just to come back quickly about what you were talking about uh, before previously, is that that will be marvelous. It's the day you claim you have the documentation in place. The issue for the time being is that when you are a very important writers and then you have decided to co-write with nine or 12 different composers that themselves have publishers, and then how long do you take just to implement the agreement between the different participants? And we may receive the documentation maybe one or two years later. So you have to keep, and that's our chance, we have a dynamic documentation at SASM, you have to be able to do backclaim based on the image of the first invoice. So that, that's not only to solve at a given moment the documentation, you have to keep in a memory documentation all what happened in the previous years. And then you can correctly do backclaim to the DSP. Backclaim is another round of invoicing you do for a given period to the DSP. So that's a lot of complexity. And on top of that, if I may add, that's easy here. We're talking about US, PROs, or uh, UK, or French. There is a lot of society that has not been able even to set up their own documentation tool, you know? And uh, we're struggling, and I know that a lot of African society are still yet prepared to get that kind of challenge, the massive ingestion of data. So even if we have maybe the tools now, they're still missing documentation, even some composers, for instance, we're talking about Africa, even some composers in Africa don't know what is the understanding of publishing rights. You know, not to mention uh, Middle East, and I know there was a panel about that. So there is still a lot to do, but our chance is that there is more and more tech, and PROs and publishers together are committed to get uh, that achieved soon. number of things in there. I mean, I'll, I'll ask Barbara first. I mean, this idea that I think it is true that 10 years ago, when that GRD project was underway, there was a sort of feeling 
quite a lot of rights owners, whether they were societies or publishers or labels or whatever, data was power. And if we give up our data, we lose some of our power. And so there was a resistance to, to share that. I mean, in your experience of reaching out to the publishers with, with the, the new side to the Grace Note business, have you found a much more of a willingness, this is a, data, this is a problem we need to fix. If sharing our data is how we fix it, let's share our data. Yes, of course. Um, we've, in our discussions with the publishers, everybody is really ready to collaborate. Transparency is the big buzzword. Everybody wants their data to be um, to be clean and transparent. And the new copyright legislation, both in the US and the EU, is encouraging more transparency. So I think really, yeah, 10 years ago, this couldn't have happened. But now, the, the, the environment, the, ad the atmosphere, the attitudes, it's, we're ready to create a much more efficient solution, yeah. In, in terms of helping the smaller societies get the good data in, I mean, if we come to Fernando next, I mean, I know obviously you, you work with a lot of societies in, in, in Latin America, you're starting to talk to societies in Africa, some of those are bigger societies, but some of them are quite small societies, maybe less advanced societies. So, you know, is, do you think for those societies, are, are there services like the ones you are offering, which can help the, the organizations which can't afford to invest because they're not sitting on so many big reserves, should they be looking to solutions where they could be get, getting up to where we need them to be so we're getting good data to start with? Yes, uh, for example, in, in South America, you will find uh, outdoor societies that may have only two people comprising the, the documentation team, and probably one of those people is the one who answers the phone when someone calls to the outdoor society. They make a lot of effort in order to, to, to register as much work as they can, but you know that can be impossible. So the, there are a lot of initiatives of the rest of the other PROs in Latin America gathered in Latin Autor the, to create programs in order to help these auto societies. One was very important last year where, where they moved all their system into a single system into the cloud, so that helped a lot to these smaller auto societies. And now this week started a very important program uh, managed by, La by Latin Autor that we are collaborating, that we, are cre we have created a regional Latin Autor node of the system. Uh, all the, the, the works are registered regionally and populated automatically to the rest of the auto societies where the work is not registered. Because that is an issue that we are, we need to find, well, but, but we found a workaround in LATAM that we have identified a lot of, of works to be paid to the auto society, the performing rights, but unfortunately the work was not registered into the local database. So this is a way to help the auto societies. A Latin author created this regional uh, resistance, res work registration node in order to uh, push into those auto society where the work is not registered we will be automatically informed of that and and the and the royalties will be automatically released to that auto society and what is very important that those uh, payments released by by the latin american one stop shop all the statements are already coded with their own auto society song code so no further matching is needed, so they input the, 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 the statement into the system and automatically the payment orders are generated. No further process is needed, so uh, all the process has traceability and no delay. We talked that, that people seem to be more willing to, to, to share their data now. I suppose the flip side of that is we do have a, a different entities around the world, some societies, some label publisher driven, some commercially driven, some represented here on, on the stage today. Um, and in a way, some of you are offering competing services, competing solutions. And so we may have got over the issue of people not wanting to share their data, but then we do have competing solutions. Now, is it that these competing solutions can, can coexist and it's just a case of enforcing the standards and having some integration? Or, or does there have to be winners and losers for this? And, and anyone can come in on that. I think, uh, you know, we, we see it as being, you know, as I was saying at the start, that we're a communication layer and we're, we're building to all these different databases. So one of the first things that anyone ever says to us is, oh, you're going to do royalties, you're going to be a royalties company and do royalties information and do payments. Absolutely not. 
gives us a very specialist knowledge. We don't see that as being part of what we offer. You know, we all hold that information and we, keep, we, we run a public-private blockchain, so your public information is your Apple-ready information, your private information is your writer splits and everything like that. But that's for other parties to actually do. And I feel, you know, that's where we've got further down the line that we're actually collaborating with other parties. We see um, a lot of uh, people out there as, as data sources that we can use. So we partner with a company called Exactuals who have a Ray algorithm which is, does data cleansing. And so for historical data, it's great. We can use that to build into our system. And that's some of the partnerships as head of, as head of business development I'm trying to build out now with other partners to say that, well, we'll collaborate and we'll all work on this together. Because I don't think any of us can solve all the problems just on our own. We have to work together. We've alluded to this already. I mean, there is a big education element to this um, because I suppose even if all of these various initiatives we've got here and the others um, work and we start to get better at ISLC, ISWC matching and we have agreement across the world of what that is, we get better at spotting split disputes and we start to integrate all our databases, if you put bad data in, <laughs> you get bad data out. People will still not get paid. And I suppose that does begin with writers remembering to do their splits and agreeing their splits and logging their splits. And, and likewise, on the recording side, as you increasingly have people self-releasing, is, well, who owns this recording and who is doing it? Now, I know there is a, an education element to what Song Trust do. And, and uh, I mean, is, is it how basic do you have to go and how far can you take it in, in educating the, the, the DIY artists and writers? Right, so it, it, there is a bit of the, uh, the alphabet soup that has come up here, right, with all of the different acronyms. And I, I mean, so many people that we speak to on the individual creator level have sort of washed their hands of publishing thinking that it's not, it's too confusing, it's not available to them. And, and historically, that's almost true for this strata of of creator. Um, so we really do try to break it down and, you know, use as many, I, I like your, your graphic representation too, Chris, uh, but to try to, to, you know, really make it simple that there are these two royalty streams and that, you know, it, it around the world, every different domicile has different responsibilities and requirements and different rights are treated different ways. And, and, Hopefully, through that information, there is a little bit more accessibility and a little bit more of a, okay, well, if we can make our case and then they think that we are the right person to represent their work, then then they feel more like the business that they are. And that's one of the things that I think about a lot is that each each music creator is actually a business entity and has requirements and responsibilities. And as nice as it is to think that you don't have to do that kind of sort of from the ground grunt work, that helps the entire ecosystem be more successful. So we, we do try to say work is a good thing. And if you do it, you will eventually get the money. And it will be the, one, the, the money that has been streamed and consumed around the world that is tied to you will hopefully eventually reach its way. There was also a challenge, isn't there? I mean, obviously, creative people are, are brilliant at what they do. And they write a brilliant song. And they're very excited about that song. Um, they're not necessarily the people who then immediately think, oh, we must get our spreadsheets out and update it. I mean, just, just sort of, I mean, I know Vladimir, one thing we were talking about the other night. I mean, do we think ultimately there may be some technological solutions that make that process ever easier, ever more automatic? But it's not like I think it and it's done. There's work. So you have to do something. But come to. Um, but that, that's important. Sorry. Everybody should cooperate and work on that. You can't just imagine that we had the discussion about the MLC, for instance, and the database. That can't be just a company set up like this that suddenly will set up the wonderful database that everybody has been expecting in the US for I don't know how long. Everybody must work on that. And people, human people, <laughs> with tech, but human people first. And then Vladimir, finally on that. So the, uh, we, we had some experience of trying to persuade or educate uh, uh, our partners uh, through the years, their teams, their, their customers, or their writers. So we're working with almost thousands of publishers all over the world. So they all have certain, as I've said, decent expertise on it. But it's, uh, the, uh, our, we, we convinced that creative people have to be staying creative. They shouldn't be touching anything what uh, relates uh, relates to the administration. So we've understood. So the, uh, when you talk to the writer, if you ask him uh, to express himself, 
he'd rather express himself in the form of the colors, sounds, gestures, but he's heavily or hardly can express himself in the in form of a typing. He cannot describe himself. So, and we've started to go into into direction uh, to try to squeeze the data which is necessary to identify them or uh, let them disclose the information on how they split their shares or something in different form rather than typing in. And that's what we're working on now because we see it's a big barrier, it's a big gap for creative people to try to document their work, to try to identify themselves in a classical manner. And I think there's, cause there's almost three elements to that. So on one level, maybe for the time being, we have to have a reality check in trying to say to young artists who are genuinely DIY is this is how you get paid. But then secondly, which I know was a conversation we had in the Artist Hub yesterday, it's also recognising that DIY doesn't really mean do it yourself. It means find a team, find a business model and make it work. Um, and, and, but then the third thing is maybe there is, I think that's the idea of typing in numbers, typing in names, is there a better way? There may well be a technological solution to make it easier to be sharing that information through voice or through audio or whatever. So there may be even a technological solution to getting good data in at the start. Uh, the alarms that are going off are telling us that our time is up, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, a lot to cover. Uh, I hope if we regroup in three or four years' time, we will actually have made some significant movement, but we will see. Um, as we said, CMU Media, and we've been working on this for a while, we're going to be publishing a white paper, basically a quick summary of my speed briefing and these conversations and some other people I've been speaking to. Um, so look out for that coming out in a few weeks' time. You can download my slides from the CMU website if you so wish. So we'll share the link for that on the CMU socials and the Medem socials. Um, there's lots more interesting conversations coming up when it comes to music rights here for the rest of the afternoon. So do stick around for that. But before we do that, please, a very quick round of applause for my panel. Thank you. Thank you.